Okay, we're recording. Barbara, in three, two, one. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this On Aging Conversation. My name is Barbara McMillan, Provincial Community Engagement Coordinator for United Way British Columbia's Healthy Aging Team, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional ancestral territories of all First Nations in this land we now call Canada, on which we gratefully work and gather. The On Aging Conversation series is a collaboration between Healthy Aging Corps and Help Age Canada. If you missed earlier episodes, you'll find them on Apple Podcasts and on Healthy Aging Core Canada, the national knowledge hub connecting agencies that support and advance independent living for older Canadians. You'll also find the lineup of on aging speakers on Core, as well as delivered to your inbox if you signed up for the twice monthly Core Canada e news at www.healthyagingcore.ca. And we really encourage you to do that. In our work with CORE, Help Age, and the extraordinary network of community-based seniors serving agencies, volunteers, and professionals across Canada, we are privileged to encounter many thought leaders and innovators in the field of healthy aging. And so On Aging Conversations was launched to help bring some of these ideas, innovations, and perspectives to a wider audience. And that's it, a 30-minute conversation with a featured guest, providing healthy aging information, ideas, and inspiration every two weeks. And I'll now turn it over to Gregor Snedden, CEO of HelpAge Canada, your host for On Aging. Thanks, Barb. It's great to be here again this week and to introduce to you shortly our wonderful guest. Those of you who don't know HelpAge Canada, we support community-based initiatives through partnerships across Canada and abroad to improve the lives of older people and their communities. This week, I'm just thrilled to introduce to you a very good friend of mine and somebody we've been really looking forward to welcoming to On Aging, and this just seemed like a great moment. Laura Tamblin-Watt, Assistant Professor at the Factor Interwash Faculty of Social Work and a Fellow of the Institute for Life, Course, and Aging. She's a lawyer and the CEO of CanAge, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. Previously, she was the long-term National Director of the Canadian Centre for Elder Law and an expert in law and aging issues. Anyone who knows Laura knows she's also just one heck of a gal, always getting us up into all kinds of trouble here and there. And it's just an absolute privilege to welcome uh, welcome you, Laura, my dear friend, to On Aging. Oh, listen, I'm so happy to be here. This is just fantastic. Throughout the, our On Aging series, we've had the chance to speak to all kinds of folks and to discuss all kinds of topics. And we could probably spend the whole day talking about this, that, and the other thing, especially given that we're both ENFPs and probably a good smack of ADHD to boot. So I'm going to try and keep us to our time here <laughs> and cover off a few things. but I. I just want to first say you've had such a rich experience and you bring so much passion and energy to what you do. You've got a lot of stamps on your life passport. Tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you end up where you are now? I always knew that social justice is the kind of work I wanted to do. And I think it's like so many people in the field of aging, there's usually a personal connection. So I was very involved with my grandparents and supporting them, one through a dementia journey, one through actually a journey that was a rare disease, supported other older adults in our life as well. And so I think for me, there was a normalization of that. And I think if you talk to a lot of other people who are in the field, that's a story that really resonates. That there's an older person in their life that usually tends to be quite connected to them. Always wanted to go to law school and be a lawyer. So that was kind of a way that I did that. But all the way through from high school on, I volunteered with the Alzheimer's Society as a visitor. My undergrad, I visited a woman named Laura and we had about the same conversation every time, twice a week for like three years. And it was great. And she was always surprised that my name was Laura too. And it was <laughs> delightful. So I think there's a bit of humor that gets infused in some of these things. I worked in the field of uh, rape crisis and sexual assault and uh, child abuse and all the other fun things that people like to talk about. And when it came out, however, and I was in my early practice, I started doing work in the field of health and estates, both of those areas. And I remember the day where I had a very complex issue. It was, in fact, it was an elder abuse issue. We really didn't even have words to call it that at that point. And I was trying to help, let's call her Mrs. Smith, with an issue. Really, it was around financial and other forms of exploitation for her son. And she had the wherewithal to hire a lawyer, which most people do not for many reasons, but not only financial. And she was able to push back and she wanted to fight back. And there were a few other pieces to this that 
that made it very clear that it was through the unique situations of Mrs. Smith, not her name, that she was able to extract herself from this very difficult situation. I remember sitting down and thinking, I don't want to just help this Mrs. Smith. I want to help all of the Mrs. Smiths. And so that led me into work in elder abuse and and so on. Was the original national director of the Canadian Centre for Elder Law, which is a law reform think tank in the field. And we built that up and did a short gent when I wanted to see what did, what would it feel like if I got up in front of a room and said, I actually am an advocate. Because if you work in charities, you mostly can't say that. And mm-hmm. I worked a lot of times in organizations that we had to start off by saying, I don't do advocacy. The problem was we didn't have very good advocacy in this country. I mean, that's just a reality of the circumstance. And so worked for some time. And we thought, what would it be like if we actually started up a purpose-built National Seniors Advocacy Organization, did it right from the beginning. And boy, we ended up launching six months early because something called COVID happened. Well, I remember that was right when you and I became acquainted. We connected and put our heads together. That was a really exciting time. I remember some late nights Mm -hmm. hammering through some ideas and working with the federal government to see how we could help Canadians. I don't know whether everybody really understands what an advocacy organization does. What does it look like? I mean, we, we see you on TV all the time. You're clearly fighting for the rights of older people on so many issues, whether the scorecards that you've been doing, you've got your voices piece that you put out last year, you've written a book, you're doing a a lot of things, but what does an advocacy organization do? And what does Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization do? Tell us about Canada. I think of advocacy in many ways as that bridge point between marketing on the one hand and public policy on the other hand. It's a combination of raising awareness and making change. Hopefully you do good advocacy and you're not just out there yelling and screaming because that's actually not very helpful. That's just called complaining. So one of the things that we try to do is think of it in two visuals. So the first is imagine that you're sitting in a chair and you've got two levers in front of you. So lever number one is what I call your eat right and exercise lever. It's the lever which is trying to encourage people to do the good things that they should do, probably to improve their lives. I suspect there's bad levers too, but we're not talking about that kind of advocacy. We're talking about leading them (laughs) down into good things. So everyone knows they're supposed to eat right and exercise. You know, there's not more information about eating right and exercise that I think is the piece that, that we need to know. It's not like one day I woke up and hit myself over the head and thought, oh, if only I stopped eating all the Oreos, staying up all night and, you know, having one too many drinks, my life would be like, really? Thank you for the new education. Oh, we've been learning about eating right and exercising our whole life in many, many different ways. And turns out the solution to many problems is, wait for it, eat right and exercise. Dementia, (laughs) eat right and exercise right? Heart conditions, eat right and exercise. Lots of these things are are pieces, but they're not advocacy, they're information. It doesn't get that person up off the sofa. So what advocacy does is in that one lever is it helps to prompt action. It helps to help get people to pull that lever and the lever for me to eat right and exercise, or in this case, to work on the rights of older people or to think about reaching out or, or connecting with people or checking in or working in local community. The thing that makes me do that will be different for me than it will be for some other people. So we have to think about what are those motivating factors? What are the nudges? What are the ways in which we can promote people to actually pull that lever and get out and move and talk and think and engage? But there's another kind of advocacy and that's the other lever. And we call it the third party lever. I can't make the federal government do just what I want by, you know, calling out the prime minister. <laughs> well, that would be very convenient, but it's funny. Well, it's not usually you might it give it a try say, sometime. Hey, You're pretty you persuasive. Know. <laughs> hey, Christian Freeland, I have this great budget for you. You know, don't, yeah. have, don't have to look at it. Just do, right. do what I say. Uh, no, it doesn't work like that. I have to convince some other third party. And in this case, I was laughing about a federal budget. But it, as we're doing this podcast, it's what we call a budget month. You know, we will do nine provincial budgets this month and a federal budget submission as well. We've got to also support other organizations, like our partners at the United Way, for instance, where you've got a million things that you could be doing. Our partners at HelpAge, you've got a million things we're doing. So how How is it that we think together about where those third party levers are? How do you prioritize them? And that leads into kind of what we do. We wanted to, I know this is a shocking idea. We want to use evidence 
to suggest what we should be doing either for ourselves, lever number one, or to help encourage the good motions, the good movements, the inclusion of public policy systems change on the other side. And, and the reality is in our advocacy across Canada, you know, we didn't really have a, a robust and rich evidence base summarized in a way that people could implement, right? Lots of people know things about aging, but no one knew exactly what to do or why or how. And so we spent about six months with about 12 people working around the clock, mining out the evidence evidence, talking to people, looking at research collaborations, et cetera, and created what we called the roadmap for an age inclusive Canada, which is called the Voices of Canada Seniors. And each of those mnemonics stands for something. So V is for violence and abuse prevention. O is for optimal health and well-being. I is for infection prevention and disaster response. C is for that whole caregiving and housing continuum. So we say caregiving, long-term care, home care, and housing. E is for economic security and S is for social inclusion. And we think of it as an accordion. So this is a manageable way for people to think about what are the issues in Canada to deal with an aging population, but also what you do about it. So you can almost click on it and it opens up like an accordion. There's 40 issues and then you click on those issues and it opens up again. And right now there's about 135 specific evidence-based recommendations. So this is a pathway. So I, I can tell you I got an email just a few minutes ago from somebody who was walking into a government house and they said, I just wanted to confirm recommendation number X, Y, and Z. I'm going to move that forward in a bill today. So if you make it easy to understand, if you make it so that people who you're meeting at different areas of interest and engagement, if you've got something for people to work on, they will. Otherwise, I think the failure of advocacy is being overwhelmed. And the failure of advocacy is being imprecise. The advantage of advocacy is when you realize that your job is to provide solutions, not problems. Wow, that's amazing. And I know Voices, it's available on your website, www.canage.ca. And that's a very compelling document, easy to read. At Help Age, we have it on our resources and we do share it widely as well. What can you say to colleagues, friends working in the community-based sector who are impassioned about something that they're seeing in their community or, or they want to see change for older people or, or other issues for that matter? But what do you tell them to do and how can they use you? How can they reach out to you? Part of what we are always interested in is both hearing the stories and then trying to grasp about how urgent that is. And many people will know that kind of urgent and important matrix. So if yeah, someone yeah, reaches yeah, out yeah. to me and they say, no, this person right now is being beaten up. I say, call 911. You know, let's not talk about elder abuse in the abstract. Like there's an urgent situation that needs to be address. You need right now to help that person, right? If you have somebody that is at risk of being, for instance, um, ejected out of hospital and onto the street with no help and support, an older person who may have cognitive impairment, you know, that's both urgent and important, but you know, I don't need you to call 911 for it. What we need to do is get in there on the ground and try to find resources. Many people just don't know what their rights are. And so part of what we try to help people do is say, you know, actually, this is the legislation. They can't do that. It doesn't mean that they're you know, bad people, but their discharge policy folks don't realize you're not actually allowed legally to discharge people without a place for them to go. And mm -hmm. that this is you know, deeply problematic. And so sometimes we help to guide people and support them so that they have the tools they need. We had one just the other day where... Um, a person was dying in a hospital and this particular hospital decided that no, they weren't going to have visiting hours uh, so that the person would have to die by themselves. <laughs> right. And the problem is the everyday person who's wrapped up in the fact that they're losing a family member doesn't necessarily know the legislation in the hospital act or can point to the policy in that regional health authority that says, no, no, if a person is at uh, end of life, they're allowed, you know, unlimited uh, visitors 24 seven, right? So we try to help yeah. and, and problemize that. I guess the piece that I just wanted to talk about was you know, where's the area of interest? So right now, for instance, we've, uh, I don't know, flagged for Help Age International, for instance, reached out and they said, we're interested in thinking about gray and green. We're thinking about interesting climate change. Are you interested in climate change? I said, yes, look at our voices. I can tell you, it says it right there, right? It's on disaster response and climate change. We have a whole palsy on it. So they may not be interested in everything, but we want to meet people where they are. If it's a housing question, we want to help and support them. And for our friends at the United Way, one of the big resources that we support them to is Healthy Aging Core, that incredible online platform, which has just been transformative in the model. We try to help people individually. We don't say that we're service delivery. We're not service delivery, but we answer yeah. every question that comes in. And, and then we try to figure out how to make system change 
and make it stick. That's amazing. You're right in the thick of it. And you know, you engage with so many people, everything from federal government, even cabinet members, right down to local, your local care home, to seniors in your own community from coast to coast. What's thumping right now? What do you think are the key issues that we need to be advocating for? Where's the movement and change needed that you are aware of and that you see? I think there's a few structural pieces and there's a few individual pieces. So if you'll grant me, I'll give you the levers answer. So okay, with okay. lever number it, one, it. I think we need capacity building and support and advocacy around social isolation and in particular loneliness. Now, social isolation and loneliness are not the same thing, but they often go hand in hand. So you can be lonely without being isolated. It, loneliness is a feeling. It's an experience. Social isolation is more of a structural situation. We're coming, I say, out of a pandemic with some hope. Having said that, our exposures are just as bad as they were in 2021. Maybe we've just got used to COVID, but this has, I think, fundamentally changed the way that people think about aging. And on the one hand, there's an opportunity on the other hand, there's a, a worry, but I think that worry breeds opportunity as well. People are looking at situations and thinking, oh, if I don't plan for this, this terrible thing could happen to me. And, you know, I think that being locked up in long-term care was a visceral, actually almost tactile experience for many people, even if they didn't have people in long-term care and they saw it. And what I think that's prompted an opportunity to say, how is it that we can keep people separate from each other? And what does social inclusion look like? So I think kind of designing your future is an opportunity out of the worry of loneliness. Us. And I think there's some really interesting stuff that's happening around that co-housing, thinking about naturally occurring retirement communities, thinking about, you know, can my book club be also some type of support? Can we bring in people to think about it at a local level? So I think there's a really interesting batch of stuff that's happening around that. I'm very excited about it. Um, earlier, just today, I was in a research um, and conversational group looking at how can we perhaps push for loneliness to be part of a cabinet minister's remit. And many people will know that in the UK, there is a minister for loneliness. And I would like to see that. So even though we're having these very grassroots mm -hmm. conversations, you know, what's the best way to not be socially isolated? Answer, get a dog. Actually, it's the very best way that you do it. And actually evidence supports You're this. talking from personal experience. No, yeah, yeah, personal experience too. Yeah, exactly. You know, you got a dog <laughs> over COVID as well. But if you're a, a person that's really like lonely and socially isolated and you can get a dog and lots of people can't for many reasons, you will have to go out of your house three times a day. You will be able to talk to people. It's not weird for you to go up to somebody else with a dog. You can start those conversations in a natural way. Otherwise, yeah. it can feel quite peculiar if you randomly go up to somebody in a park and start chatting to them. It feels very uncomfortable. But yeah. if you are building those relationships, so answer, get a dog is a real one. So these individual levers that we're thinking about on the structural piece that I think we really need to be moving in big leaps and bounds on is around things like our national standards, which uh, listeners will know were recently released. And there has been $3 billion pledged by the federal government to help implement national standards in long-term care. Now, it's going to cost about $14 billion to actually implement them. So three is a nice place to start. But of course, since only between four and 6% of national of seniors across this country will ever go into long-term care, it's very important that we do national standards for our most vulnerable, but there's about 95% of seniors that we need to be thinking about in terms of home and community care, of supports, of integration. And I'm really excited about new conversations around that. The reality is we're starting to run out of leeway. Systems are actually breaking. So maybe this is the time that we will get some attention and investment. Well, as we look at our sector and of all of these issues, you know, we know that uh, older people is the fastest growing demographic uh, all over the world. And yet, as we all know, it is under resourced, doesn't have the capacity to really prepare and address. Uh, people are living longer, rising population. We have ongoing dementia. And we're just not prepared. Who are the leaders for tomorrow? How are we going to build capacity, bring in the right people to lead us into the future? And a lot of our issues, as we know, is that people are so underpaid in our industry. It's hard to retain workforce. Even our wonderful personal support workers in our hospitals that are just treated poorly, terrible hours, no benefits, right up to leaders in the field of gerontology. How are we going to build a future for this whole layer of our society? I, I'm going to answer that question with a bit of a highfalutin answer and then a couple of practical things okay. as well. So my highfalutin answer is we need to push age much more concretely into the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversations. That ageism, which is the single most prevalent form of discrimination in the world, by the way, World Health Organization has found that. And Statistics Canada found that in Canada as well. So more than, more than half of Canadians are profoundly ageist. So this may not seem like an easy answer to how do we build capacity in the sector, but 
But let me tell you, unless people want to go and do it, fundamentally, it doesn't matter how well it pays. It doesn't how if you don't want to do it, people won't go to it. But if we are including aging as an area of involved social engagement, if we're thinking about it the way that we're thinking about other forms of social engagement and improvement and excitement, whether it's thinking about like climate change, right? I was around a long time ago where we could not get people to even pick up the phone and think about climate change. And now I challenge you to try to mm. hold a can and not recycle it. I don't necessarily think that recycling my one can is going to fix climate change. But what we've seen is a big transformation of norms, right? We've, we're rethinking it. We're understanding these things in different ways. Same when we're thinking about other forms of discrimination or, or engagement. You know, these are areas that people are interested. They want to push around. They want to think around. Think about technology. Very interesting. Now think about technology and women and technology. And we think about intersectionalism and so on. So that's my highfalutin answer. It needs to be, first of all, not so profoundly stigmatized. And we need to reframe that this area is interesting and <laughs> lest I say kind of cool to work in. Now, this is where you get my practical answer. Turns out if you actually make jobs available to people and you pay them for training and you make those jobs stable and you provide them with pensions and benefits and there's encouragement at that training level, if it's maybe it's academic encouragement of grants and so on, people have no problem lining up for those jobs. And we saw that happen in Quebec as a point of note. So in Quebec, in the first year of the pandemic, massively, massively understaffed, same problem as Ontario and the same outcomes really as Ontario when it came to you know military involvement and so on in long-term care took the step of mass hiring. It, it kind of like a PSW, it's a, it's a little bit analogous to that, right? It's a, a non-credentialed one. What we see is they offered almost $50,000, full-time jobs, pensions and benefits, and paid you during training. And they filled every single one of those seats. Now, there was some attrition. I'm not saying that there wasn't. Not everyone ended up in there, but it was a workforce that they did. So I think that there is, as you say, some really easy answers to problems that people bring their hands about. If you make it respected, reasonable, stable, and make it in a way that there's a ladder up for you to improve and increase. So if you come in as a healthcare aide or a support worker, or wherever else, but there's a pathway for micro-credentialing that allows you to move towards other specialities or other types of areas. I think that's really important. What happens is people get tossed into some seniors care, whether it be home and support, whether it be even community care. But let me talk specifically about congregate care supports in particular. They're put in, but there's no way to ladder up, right? So you come in and there's no pathway for you to become then a licensed practical nurse, for instance. Not really. Right. There's no pathway for you to become a person who can give medications at a higher level. There's no pathway for you to become a social coordinator necessarily. And so we need to ladder those people up. We also need to understand that people who've been working in seniors years care for the last three years are traumatized. They're just traumatized. The degree of PTSD that we're seeing in our seniors care workforce is profound. And unlike in acute care, the narratives are very different. So if you're in acute care, if you're a hospital worker, something like that, you're a hero, right? We bang pots and pans for you. We tell you how great you are. If you're working in long-term care, you're probably a terrible person because you let terrible things happen. And of course, that, neither of those things are true. There are good people trying to work really hard. Sometimes people get upset with the state of hospital care, upset with the state of long-term care, but the care workers there are, are doing their best, working often around the clock. Some of them make huge sacrifices to do this work and they could do other work. But where do we lose our long-term care workers or home care workers to? Either agencies, which pay more money and then contract them back to their regular jobs, which by the way, it's supposed to be a stopgap measure. In some places, even I'll just give the example of Northern Ontario, long-term care homes are using 80% agency staff. So that's supposed to be like, you know, eight, nine, maybe 10% agency staff as sort of relief workers for when your regular staff is off. But of course, if you're going to get paid more and get better hours, you're going to work for the agency. Alternatively, as soon as a job comes up in the acute care, like in a hospital, you get paid more, pensions, benefits, and your hero, we leave as well. So changing that narrative of the individual experience, I think is going to be really important to it. Wow. That's really rich. That's rich. I got to tell you, like immigration, that's an easy one. We're starting <laughs> yeah. to do that. Like BC is starting to do it. Nova Scotia is starting to do it. There's some stuff happening in federal government. You know, this is where you go down the deep dive of things like NOC codes, NOC codes, and how do you get in and what do we do? Like, right. And so, you know, we really, Canada needs immigrants. We need lots and lots of immigration. We're a country of a lot of room and not a lot of people. And we need to make sure that people don't end up driving taxis when they're neurologists. And we need to make sure that we're also not stripping other countries of healthcare workers because we want healthcare workers. There's a way of that, that being inappropriate too, but a pathway to residency, a pathway to citizenship 
relationship and a pathway to credentialing that makes sense. We're starting to work on that really well, but unless we fix it, like there's just not enough human beings to help. And I guess the other piece I would add is we need to integrate technology so much more into what we do. People are actually excited for that. But since we're seeing so many long-term care homes or home care that actually don't have even internet, it's pretty hard to fix something when you don't have even the basics. So that's right. why I think we need to think about the structural integrity of our systems as much as we need to think about the people. Wow, this is a huge, huge conversation. We could just spend a whole session just talking on this one thing. I did want to, though, make sure I, I reached over to Barb. Laura, you mentioned environment and climate change, and we know that many older adults tend to experience the adverse effects of climate disasters much more severely than other younger people. And for example, the 500 plus older adults who we lost in the BC heat dome in, in 2021. So we know that there's lots to be done to prevent these kinds of devastating losses. And, and I'm just wondering from an advocacy perspective, what would be your number one key prompt or lever? We have advocated for and will continue to advocate for a national seniors disaster strategy. It's ridiculous we don't have one. We know, as you say, if we're looking at climate emergencies, both the ones we have now and the ones we're facing in the future, they will absolutely affect older people much more. There's no question. We're also helping on little things. Like there's a private members bill that's going to be going in soon that's saying in built environments that are vertical or even bigger congregate environments, we're just talking about things like apartments, but certainly seniors apartments or retirement homes or other types of Longer get housing. There should at least be one generator backup because without water, without oxygen, and I say oxygen because many people are on oxygen. You can't get electricity, you can't get your oxygen. So these are life and death situations. So we need to stop thinking about climate disasters as affecting everyone the same or you know, being told one more time that you have to have your disaster backpack with your things. I'm thinking, I don't need a disaster backpack. I need someone to help the people with dementia go in and get to a safe place. They don't need a backpack full of whatever. Although I do want them to have their meds, those types of things. We can can't keep turning a blind eye to the fact that overwhelmingly who we lose are older people. We have to ask ourselves is why do we think that's okay? Laura, we so much enjoy working with you, all of us. It's always such a pleasure to get to work together on various fronts and have you here with us today has just been a real treat. So thankful that you were able to join us in your busy schedule and be on this side of the interview and uh, be able to share your thoughts uh, and to bring your passion and leadership and wisdom. And, and I hope we can do this again before too long. I want to say is one of the things that individuals can do, I'll pull their own little lever, right? is they can reach out and share their stories. You would be astonished at how few people do this. And you don't have to even use your own name if you like. And one of the things you can do is send in your stories to us at info at canage.ca. We're gathering up stories. We use that for testimony. Every time we're in front of government, I start off with a story a person has written to us. You can share your stories so that when we go to government and we're saying, why should the core, healthy aging core be expanded and enriched? I can say these are the reasons why. So I can tell people that, you know, Help Age Canada is helping smaller rural communities that would not have any other support otherwise. And if you tell your story, both good and bad, that is the lever that you have in your own hand. So please, please think of sharing it. Info at canage.ca, a couple of words, a long letter. We listen and we answer every one of them. Excellent. Thanks so much, Laura. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Laura. Well, we'll see you all next time. Thanks everyone for being with us. And it's been just great speaking with Laura Tamblin Watts today. Again, you can visit www.canage.ca and send your stories to info at canage.ca. And we'll look forward to seeing you all next time here at On Aging, Canadian.